What a beautiful message and song. And what a wonderful verse and scripture that that is. Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. It's good to know you're there. And thank you for the beautiful children's story. I was happy to be a child on the front seat this morning. And uh, what an important lesson that is. I just wanted to... I'm getting a bit of feedback here. Maybe I'll bend it. Uh, is that better? Are we good there? Yes, good. I just wanted to say how excited I am to be here today, not just um, myself, but I'm actually here with my husband. This is our first traveling and um, trip like this together, so I'm very excited to share a first with you. And also traveling here with um, my sister, Malita, and my friend, Sonia, which is also really exciting because um, this afternoon, at, in the evening, rather, I should say, we're going to have a concert. And uh, when we were little as kids, my mum would take us to church every Sabbath and we'd sit in the pews and we'd just think, wow, it's pretty exciting what happens up the front in church. And I would go home and I would stand in front of my full-length mirror in our house as a child and I would preach to the mirror, just pretend, make things up. And one day my sister interrupted me while I was in one of history's deepest sermons. No one would understand it, not even me. And uh, she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm playing church. She said, can I play? I said, all right. So she would come do the song service, take up the offering, say the prayer, sing a special music. I would preach. Then at the end, we'd stand together for our closing song. And then I'd shake her hand and thank her for coming at the end of the service. And she walked out of the room. And uh, it's very special because we're not playing church anymore. Here we are. We're, we're here for real. And it's just a joy to serve the Lord here with you. And I thank you to Pastor Peter for having us in your church. And I also wanted to thank Laura Chapman for just the invitation, the vision to see this happen as well. And her team who've done a fantastic job of turning this church into a house of prayer. I don't know if you've noticed, but there are quotes on prayer everywhere around this church today, and they've even turned this little room out the back into a prayer room as well. So make the most of it. Have a look after the service, walk around, and be blessed by the work that they have put into this. Uh, this afternoon, we will continue after lunch. Stay for lunch. But this afternoon at 2.30, we're going to have another meeting of prayer. But this will be one where the highlight of this meeting will be a prayer meeting. And I'm really looking forward to sharing that with you. Before we go any further, would you bow your heads as we pray. Our loving Father in heaven, as we look into your word today, as we listen to the words of Jesus from the Bible, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be present in our midst. I pray, Lord, that you would teach us. I pray that you would help us to have a hunger and a thirst to know more of you and to understand your love more fully today. May we see today the true privilege of prayer and its great need in each of our lives. And so we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Napoleon, it is said, that he would often walk past a map of the world and he would see on that map this place on the map and he would growl as he would look at that map and he would say to himself, oh, there sleeps a sleeping giant. If she wakes, she will shake the world. And the giant of which Napoleon spoke was the country of China. He believed that if China woke up to its full potential, she would become the world's superpower. Friends, I believe that that is exactly the way the devil looks at God's church. He sees God's people and he says, there sleeps a giant. If she wakes and realizes her full potential in the Lord Jesus Christ, she will shake the world. And he will do everything in his power to stop you and I from recognizing what God is calling for us to be and from stopping us from connecting with God through prayer, as was demonstrated in our children's story this this morning. And so this morning, we are going to look at the need of prayer. How can you and I be a threat to the devil and be connected with Jesus as it is our privilege to be? So if you have your Bibles, take them out, turn with me this morning to the book of Matthew. We are going to the Sermon on the Mount. We're in Matthew chapter 6. 
And I'd like you to notice with me from verses 5 onwards, Jesus describes to us the model prayer. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. We'll begin. Notice what the Bible says. Sorry, my mic is just... Is that better? Maybe? Yeah, that sounds good. All right, what does Jesus say? Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. He says, and when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly." I want to highlight for you, first of all, today that when Jesus calls his disciples to pray, he assumes that you and I will make time for prayer in our daily lives. When I do this, I am not flexing my muscles. <laughs> this is an amen moment. God expects for his children to talk to him. He invites you to talk to him, and he anticipates that you will talk to him. And he says, when you come to talk to me, don't show off. This is a personal interaction between you and me. And he says, go to a secret place. So I want to encourage you, if you do not have a place where you can go and be alone with Jesus, your assignment after the service today is to find that place where you can speak with your maker and where you can hear his voice. In fact, this is so important because it's so powerful. There's a little quote from the book Great Controversy which says this, that it was from the secret place place of prayer that came the power that shook the world during the great reformation amen from the secret place of prayer that's where the great reformation was born and where it's where it came from and it's a wonderful thing to know as was demonstrated so wonderfully this morning in our children's story that when we pray we don't have to worry about wi-fi reception we don't have to worry about coverage or battery we can access the lord wherever we are if we're in a lion's den if we're in the belly of a whale we can talk to the lord at all times because prayer is as you know the breath of the soul it is the opening of our hearts to our best and dearest friend. And who can be unhappy when we have such a friend as Jesus? Prayer is the secret to spiritual power. If your church is dying, it's a, it may be because we're not praying. A, a praying church is a living church. A praying church is a church that is connected with God. We cannot go without breathing much less we cannot be a Christian without praying. Do you know that the Guinness World Record for the longest breath ever held, it's held by a, does anybody know their nationality? Ah, oh, my husband knows. <laughs> it's a German. He held his breath for 22 minutes and 22 seconds. That is amazing. But friends, the Bible says that if prayer is the breath of the soul, the Bible also says we should pray without ceasing. We need to learn to educate our hearts and minds to ever be cognizant of the fact that we are in God's presence. There's no way you can go to hide from God. And so when you give yourself to God, you walk with him. And he is your constant companion every single day of your life. So how should we pray? Well, Jesus taught us how to pray. And I want you to imagine in your mind that you are with the disciples because one day they stumbled upon Jesus as he was praying. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine stumbling upon the Son of God as he was having his prayer time? Imagine listening to his prayers. The Bible tells us he cried out to God in prayer. And they were so impressed by his prayer life, so moved by the type of praying he did as they listened to his prayers. But the Bible tells us in the book of Luke chapter 11, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. In fact, when we look at um, the life of Jesus, we see his life was one of ceaseless activity. 
He's constantly healing people's going here, going there. He's very busy. In fact, the, the spirit of prophecy tells us that his mother and brothers and the disciples were afraid that he might sacrifice his own life with all of this activity that he was engaging in every day. But they noticed that whenever Jesus came away from a time of prayer, he looked refreshed. His face had a glow. He had peace on his, in his heart. And you, they could see it on his face. And so they wanted to know, how can we connect with God like you do? We want to have this kind of experience as well. And friends, if the Savior of the world, the Son of God, felt it a necessity to pray, how much more should you and I feel it a burden in our hearts to pray as well? He needed prayer. How much more do I need prayer? There are hours of prayer that Jesus spent, they saw is in the power of his life. And so the, they asked him to teach them to pray, but we will notice that actually he repeats when, he asks, when they ask him, Lord, teach us to pray. Jesus repeats the Lord's prayer, which he had already given to them in the Sermon on the Mount. Isn't that interesting? He doesn't teach them some new form of prayer as a means of helping them to pray. He repeats the prayer he has already taught them from the Sermon on the Mount. And it's as if Jesus is trying to say to his disciples, you need to understand what I've already taught you because it's deeper and than, you, than you have yet understood and you still haven't caught it yet. And by the way, the words that we study today, they're not the only words you can use to pray, but they outline for us how we should come to God in prayer. So let's read them together. Um, first of all, let's keep reading verse 7 and 8, and then we'll come to verse 9. When you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask. And then he says, in this manner therefore pray. I just want to pause here and highlight that prayer is something that can be, it can be taught and it can be learned. Are you wanting for your prayer life to be deeper? Are you wanting for your prayer life to be stronger? Good news, brothers and sisters. Jesus can teach us to pray. And if we have come to him with the humility of heart as learners, say, Lord, teach me. God will teach us. And our relationship can go deeper when we come to him with an attitude of prayer like this. And I just also want to say I am grateful that the disciples were taking notes when Jesus shared his insights and prayer. What a, what a blessing the world would have missed out of if they hadn't recorded his words right here. So let's read. What does Jesus say? In this manner, therefore, pray our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Prayer is so important. That Spurgeon once said, I would rather teach one man to pray than ten men to preach. I'd rather te teach one man to pray than ten men to preach. And so Jesus, he begins. He begins and he teaches them how to pray. He says, pray our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. I love this because when Jesus begins his lesson, he teaches us to call his Father our Father. Let that sink in. He is not ashamed to call us family. Isn't that beautiful? I love how on that Sunday morning when Jesus revealed himself to Mary at the tomb and he came and he said to her, go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father. He could have said, go to my disciples or go to my friends and even that's amazing but he takes it one step closer and he says, go to my brethren, go to my family. This is a wonderful truth that you have to catch today because God loves us as he loves his son. Oh, come on. That was an amen moment. <laughs> I know I didn't cue you, but God loves you as he loves his son. Angels 
when they saw the way of salvation had been made possible for you and I through the death of Jesus, when they saw that a way of escape from the curse of sin had been made, they rejoiced in heaven. They were so excited about what was now available to fallen man. How much more should you and I be rejoicing that we are the objects of God's amazing love? We're not orphans in this universe. You and I are not the product of uh, blind chance. We're not over-advanced fungi hurtling through cold and meaningless space as evolution would like us to believe. We have a creator God who loves us as he loves his son. And I was just saying to someone the other day, I was talking as I was looking at a little child and they were just playing and they were just so enjoying life. And I said, wouldn't it be great if we could be like kids all over again, not have to worry about anything, know that all of our needs were going to be provided for. And then I realized that that is exactly the way God wants us to be as little children. He is our heavenly father. And when we pray this, we are acknowledging that God he, he wants to take care of us. He wants to provide for our needs. When I pray to our Father in heaven, I am saying that as his child, I'm willing, Lord, to be guided by your wisdom, to be obedient to your leading and your calling on my life, and to know that your love for me will never change. A parent's love, it has to remain the same because the relationship cannot change, and that you, I accept his plan for my life. What a beautiful relationship that is. But not only that, Jesus goes on, he says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. What does that mean? Hallowed, to make holy. Friends, when we pray, God is not our buddy next door. We must speak to him with words of reverence and words that acknowledge who he is. He is the king of kings, who angels adore and love and, and worship. I got to uh, spend just recently a day with Pastor Pavel Goya. That was my assignment from the conference. Go spend a day with Pastor Goya. Do you know who Pastor Goya is? Have you listened to his sermons? Powerful uh, stories and answers to prayer that he shares. And I was so excited. Justin and I went together. We spent a day with him at the Grey Nomads camp in the afternoon. And we listened, we talked, we shared ideas, he, he gave us counsel. And then at the end of the day, he said, let's pray together. And I got a bit excited. I thought, oh, this is good. What will he say? How will he pray? How does this man of God pray when he approaches um, the Father in heaven? And what I noticed in the car was this. He bowed his head and with humble voice, he reverently prayed. Our Father in heaven. And there was this long pause. And then he continued. And it stood out to me and it stood out to Justin because when he comes to God, as we all, when we come to God, we are recognizing that we are coming to God in prayer. He deserves respect. He deserves honor. He, he is the maker of the universe and he is our maker as well. But more than this, not only should we be reverent in approaching God, but when we pray, hallowed be your name, did you know that it is possible for us to be outwardly professing to reverence God's name, but actually to still be denying it in our daily lives? Did you know that? To still be denying it in our own characters? We are still taking God's name in vain when like even in the time of Jesus, the Jews, they outwardly professed reverence to God, but inside they were taking God's name in vain because they were not reflecting God's character to the world around them. Keep your finger in the book of Matthew and just come over to Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 16. Notice what it says here. And I'm particularly focusing on the last part because I just think it's amazing. But this is what the Bible says. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell safely. And this is the part I really want you to see. And this is the name by which she will be called the Lord 
our righteousness. This is the name by which she will be called. The Lord, our righteousness. When we pray, friends, hallowed be your name. We are saying, Lord, may your name be hallowed in my life. We are saying, Lord, please help me to possess your lovely character and reflect it to the world around me. That's what we're praying. And it's so important. I remember when we were kids, my family would sometimes be invited to go and have a Sabbath lunch with someone else from church. And we'd all hop in the car. And even though my dad was sometimes not coming to church and but he would always come if there was lunch and make sure he was at the, the lunch as well. So we'd drive to the family's place for lunch and then we'd get there and I remember my parents would turn around in the front seat and look at my sister and I in the back seat and they would proceed to give us a list of things that we were not to say when we entered the house. A list of things that we were not to touch when we got inside. And the family secrets that were to remain family secrets. And we would just be frustrated. We just wanted to go inside and we'd say, why? And then he'd look at me and he'd say, because you represent us. As Christians, when we take on the name of Christ, we must recognize that we are representing him in this world, and we must pray, Lord, may your name be hallowed in my life. May I represent you aright to the world around me. Does that make sense? I pray so. Because straight after that, he also says, your kingdom come. Not only is God our Father, but he is the king of the universe and the interests of his kingdom should be the interests of our hearts as well. The disciples, when they were listening to Jesus, they were looking for his immediate coming and his kingdom to be established right then and there immediately. But it was not yet to be established in the way that they were expecting. This petition, though, from their lips to... Sorry, this petition from the lips of Jesus in the prayer is an assurance to you and I today that in God's time, his kingdom will come. Which means that right now, you and I are living in a time where God's kingdom of grace is being established. What do I mean by that? I mean that day by day, men and women, young people are responding to God's amazing grace. They are hearing the gospel, they are responding to the gospel, and they are surrendering their lives to Jesus. <laughs> That's something God's people get very excited about. Not only do we get excited about this, but friends, you and I should be praying for this. Praying that people will respond to God's kingdom of grace, that, God, that they will respond to his amazing grace. And I want you to know today that I believe that God is anxious to see this fulfilled. Um, in Hamilton Church, where um, my husband is pastoring, he's got two churches, the Walls End Polish and the Hamilton Church in Newcastle. But just as my, with my involvement here and, and the, what I'm seeing as we're looking at what God is doing in this one church, this is one church, I'm sure there's, God's active in all of our churches, but there was a man who's coming to our church. He's coming to our evangelistic series. Um, Justin had uh, Pastor Peter Watts come, and he's been running an evangelistic series, and God has been working miracles. But there's one young man who's been coming, and he helped us letterbox for the series, and then he came to the series. We said to him, how did you start coming to this church? How did you find out about it? He said, oh, I had a dream. And he said, in my dream, I saw Jesus standing out the front of Hamilton Church. He said, there was light emanating from the building. And I was walking along the footpath. And when I came to Jesus, he came, he hugged me, he gave me a kiss on the cheek, and he told me, you can come in here. You will be safe here. And so this man started coming to our church. <laughs> can you say amen to that? I mean, God's kingdom of grace is growing day by day. There's another man. Um, I just will tell just uh, he could tell us these stories but he uh, received a phone call last friday from an individual and he said hello i just been away i've been on holidays and i just opened my mailbox and i've just found a flyer in there inviting me to some meetings at your church i'm just wondering are they still on and he said yes and he said actually we have a, a church service tomorrow you're welcome to come 
Not only did that man come to the service, he came to the meeting in the evening as well, and he was at our food pantry on Thursday night, and he's talking to Justin about how he can be involved in welcoming people to our church. I think that's amazing. But, you know, at the time, when we letterboxed for Peter's campaign, we letterboxed how many flyers? 10,000 flyers. And I was actually thinking, and I think I may, we may have talked about it, I was like, maybe this is a, not a good use of money because we didn't really get anybody from the flyers. And then we got this phone call from one man. <laughs> I tell you, heaven is anxious for people to come to know the gospel as it is in Jesus. God is anxious to bring people into his church where he can uh, bring them into a place where they can be loved and nurtured and where they can find God's amazing grace. One other story, and then I should just let you go with that on that point. But I also wanted to tell the story of um, our Syrian friend who's coming. We have uh, at, at the food pantry... We have all different kinds of people come into Hamilton Church. The hall is packed with people from the community every week. And there's this uh, Syrian man who's there, and he doesn't speak much English. But I went up to him one Thursday night, and I said, You, come, come to this. Handed him an invitation to a cooking school we had with Melinda Archer, and then handed him the invitation to Peter's series. I did not expect for him to come, because he doesn't speak English. But that man has come to every night of our series, Bar 2. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? He sits in the back. He, we don't know what he's understanding from the series because his English is not very good. But at the end of each night when Peter makes an appeal, Peter gives everybody a card and he gives you four questions to mark yes or no to. This man has marked yes to every single question <laughs> that has been asked. He's accepted Jesus. He wants to be baptized. He wants to be rebaptized. He wants, he wants everything. He has no idea what he's ticking yes to. As I said to Justin, I said, it's probably because, you know, he's studying English and this is the easiest quiz he can pass. All he has to do is tick yes and he's got it. But uh, the beautiful thing about it is this. He lost his license because he was, he's on an L permit <laughs> and he was driving his son to school and he says, police, wee, 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 pull over, $895 fine. So he can't drive himself. So we've been dropping him home and some of the Bible workers after the meeting. And one night he said to Justin, you, my house, come, coffee. Justin said, no, 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 I'll come when I have my wife with me. So when I was with him, he says, you too, my house. <laughs> so we ended up one night in his living room. He wanted us to bring a guitar or a ukulele. I think we took our ukuleles and uh, he wanted us to sing. So we went there and we sang a few hymns. But I should say, when we walked in the house, the room was packed with his family. It was full. They had family, they had friends and neighbors that were all in the house. And uh, one of the neighbors could speak a little bit of English. Sorry. Oh, they're refugees as well. And uh, so as we, uh, we, we met with them, they wanted to offer us all of these things we couldn't drink. Then they wanted to offer us all these things we couldn't eat. But then uh, they wanted us to, um, I forget how it ended up, but this is what happened. Long and the short of it is, they were talking in Syrian, I couldn't understand them. And then the next thing, they start playing videos of Syrian dancing on the television. Um, and then the next thing, the men in the room start dancing a Syrian dance. And then the next thing, one of them reaches down, grabs my husband's arm, pulls him up, and they drag him around the room and want him to dance with them. And I'm laughing because I think this is the most unconventional visit I've ever seen in my life. And then they grab me and they pull me around the room. And so there we were in this man's living room. At the end of that, Justin said to them, can we pray with you? And they nodded through the translator. They checked, yes, we'd be happy to pray. Justin prayed for them. Some of the family members were traveling to Melbourne the next day. We prayed for their traveling mercies. We prayed for their children. And they translated the whole prayer except for the last line, which said, in the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. The whole prayer was translated. But when we prayed that line, everybody opened their eyes and they just looked at us. They didn't want to translate that line. But one of the neighbors that was there he said in Arabic to the translator, he said, I feel very emotional. That was very moving. 
We don't know where God is leading in this, but we believe that God has brought us, our new Syrian friend, as an entering wedge into a community that needs to know about Jesus. And we intend to love him. We intend to keep showing the love of Jesus to him. And I want you to be praying for our friends like him. Be praying for your friends like him, that God will open up opportunities for them to come to know Jesus too. So we should be praying. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, haste the day when our faith becomes sight because his kingdom of glory cannot come until the gospel of grace has gone to the whole world. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 24. And by the way, when you're a Christian, every trip you take is a mission trip. Um, Every trip you take is a mission trip. I will tell you, Another story about that later. (laughs) All right, your will be done. Do you know where the will of God is most clearly expressed? It's in his law. The will of God is most clearly expressed in his law because get this, the principles of his holy law, they are the principles of heaven. Think about that. You know, it's wonderful... When we travel, my, my friend Sonia here, she loves to travel. She's, she was born with a travel bug. And thanks to her, we've all done a little more travel than we probably would have. But there's nothing like coming home, isn't there? There's nothing like coming home and just feeling at home. The moment you come into Sydney and you see, well, that's for me, you see just the sights of home and you, you feel at home. Friends, God wants for us to not only get to heaven, but when we get there, he wants us to feel like we have reached home. And when we pray for his will to be done, we are praying, Lord, for the principles of heaven to be born in our hearts by his spirit today, so that when we get to heaven, we will come home. Does that make sense to you? I think it's no coincidence that the Ten Commandments in that Old Testament sanctuary, they were held in the sacred Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place of the sanctuary. And that most holy place, does anybody remember the shape of it? It's a cube. The only other cube in all the Bible is the holy city. Could it be that God is saying, because his law is in this cube in the, in the sanctuary, could, he be, could it be that God is saying he wants for him to be able to write his law on our hearts so that we will fit in to the most holy place of the universe and to his holy home? Isn't that amazing? So when we pray for your will to be done, we are praying, Lord, we want to see an end of the reign of evil and for the establishment of your wonderful kingdom of righteousness. Do you long for this day? I long for this day. A day when there'll be no more death, no more parting, no more pain. But after praying for these things, Jesus continues, and notice what it says in verse 11. He says, give us this day our daily bread. After first seeking for God's name, God's kingdom and his will to be honored and respected. Now Jesus says that you and I can confidently ask for our own needs to be supplied because we have acknowledged who it is that will supply them. When I was uh, first going to my trip, when I, on my very first trip to the United States, my parents were a bit worried because it was my very first time to the big country of the U.S. of A. So my dad said, to me one day, here, take this. And he handed me his credit card. He said, you take this. Whatever you need, if you get hungry, don't starve. Use this. If you get into trouble, use this. I listened very carefully to my dad's words. And I went to America and I took my dad at his word. I was out with my friends and they wanted to eat something. I said, hey, hey, it's okay. I got it. They said, no, 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 no. They said, no, sure. Said, we'll all pitch in and pay our part. No, it's all right. Dad said. Dad said. So I paid. <laughs> We're going to come out of the U.S. And I said, hey, why don't we get some souvenirs and bring them back? And they're like, oh, no, no, no. We can't do that. No, no. Wave the card. Dad said. Dad said. <laughs> so... Yes, when I got back home and my dad's, um, what do you call that, statement arrived, I received another talk about what he meant by 
dad said. But still, the point is this. I took him at his word, okay? <laughs> and when, when we recognize that that's my earthly father. He wants to take care of me. He gives me his dad said credit card. But my heavenly father, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. My heavenly father owns everything. And if I have a need, he says, come to me, tell me about it, and let me help you. We pray, give us this day our daily bread. And God provides, and he's like a loving parent, just as a loving parent doesn't give everything to their child all at once. But he, they supply the daily need of their children. So it is that God does with us. As the psalmist says, and I'll just read this one to you, Psalm 37, verse 25. The Bible simply says, I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. God takes care of his children. He'll take care of you. And he calls for you to pray like this. And not only to acknowledge that God will provide your physical needs, but also to acknowledge that God will provide your spiritual needs through his word as well. A little, another little story. Um, I had an exa example of this just this week again at the food pantry. I'm reading through the book of Leviticus at the moment. And I'll be honest with you, every time I've read my Bible through, every time I've come to the book of Leviticus, I get so bogged down, I just feel like skipping to the book of Psalms and just going on from there. That's how I've felt. But for the first time in my life as I'm reading this book, I'm actually really enjoying it because I'm seeing that it's all pointing to Jesus. I've finally reached a point in my spiritual journey where God can help me to see more clearly that this is looking to Jesus in a very beautiful way. So I'm having this experience in the book of Leviticus, and you think, how on earth can I share this with anybody? I end up in a conversation with this woman at the food pantry on Thursday night just this week. And we're talking about Israel Falau. And uh, she is studying political science at the University of Newcastle. And she was like talking to a news, news reporter. Her words were so well chosen. She's so educated. She's all up to date on human rights and all this kind of stuff. And it was really interesting to talk with her and hear how she's thinking. And in my heart, I'm saying, Lord, you've got to help me to know how to reach this kind of mindset because I don't know how to do it. And she said to me, she said, oh, look, we're no longer in Leviticus times anymore. She's a Jew, Jew, by the way. She only discovered she's a Jew three years ago, but ever since then, she's a passionate Jew. She said, oh, we're no longer in Leviticus times anymore. We've moved on from there. And I just said, oh, wow. She said, it's funny you mention that. I'm actually reading the book of Leviticus at this very time, and I'm really loving it. And she said to me, really? She said, I would love to sit down and study the book of Leviticus with you. She invited herself to a Bible study. Can you, can you believe it? <laughs> Over the book of Leviticus, of all things. Um, yes, so can you pray for that as well? I'm just, why, don't, why don't I share that again? Oh, yes, because when you study God's word, it provides you a daily need as well. I didn't know that I was going to be meeting this lady on this particular day, but God did. And he had me in the book of Leviticus for a reason. So we're going to meet, hopefully, in the coming few days. Jesus goes on, and we will move on as well. Verse 12, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Not only are we to show forgiveness to those who have wronged us, even if they confess their wrong to us or not, which is the remarkable thing. Jesus prays on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But this prayer is even deeper than that because God's forgiveness of us is not just a legal act of acquittal. It's not just a legal act of setting us free from condemnation. God's forgiveness is actually a reclaiming of us from sin. God's forgiveness is a transforming of our lives and of our hearts. This is why David said, Lord, create within me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. When we pray, Father, forgive us as we forgive our debtors, we are saying, Lord, help me to show the love that you have shown to me to others as well. And Satan works very hard to try and discourage us from doing this. 
He says, you're a sinner. You cannot show God's love to anybody. But you remember the words of Jesus. Remember the words of God's word where it says, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from how much? The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. I'm excited about that. Calvary alone reveals the enormity of sin and the greatness of God's love. I like the way Pastor Gary Blanchard said it. He said, without the cross, we wouldn't know how much God loves us. But because of Calvary, we know how loved we are. Yes, we may be tempted by the devil to believe we cannot be loved, but God's love is evident in unmistakable strokes on Calvary. By the way, God doesn't tempt us to sin. God will never tempt you to sin. That's the devil's task. He goes and he tries to tempt us to sin, to reveal the evil in our own character so that he can accuse us just like he does in the, in the book of Zechariah to the high priest, to Joshua. But remember that even though he tries to accuse us, we can, by God's grace, resist the evil one. Amen? Amen. In fact, listen to this. This is Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, page 117. She says, Every temptation resisted, every trial bravely borne gives us a new experience and advances us in the work of character building. The prayer, lead us not into temptation, is also a promise. Because the promise is in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, and you probably know this one very well, that if we commit ourselves to God, the Bible says no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is what? Faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Amen? Back to Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to finish this off right here. Verse 13 Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I love how he finishes his prayer. He's gone from looking at at God, his name, his kingdom, his will. And then we come and we present our needs confidently because we know who we are addressing. Our all-sufficient God. And then at the end of the prayer, he points back to God's coming kingdom, his power, and his glory. Jesus knew what the future held for his disciples. He knew that the road ahead of them was going to be rough. There were going to be thorns. The sun would not always shine on their path. He knew that the temple would be destroyed and it was going to be a real shaking of their faith. And so he directs them to look above the dominion of evil that they see in the world around them and to look to the Lord their God, their father and friend whose kingdom rules over all. And I love that he does that because right now today, you and I are sitting on the edge of the eternal world. Right now, today, we too are are before great things. We see that Jesus will soon come. But we also understand that before things are going to get amazing, things are going to get really bad too. That's what the Bible says. But Jesus calls us in his prayer to remember that yes, while the world may look like it's in upheaval all around you, remember that your heavenly father holds the program of coming events in his hands. You can trust him. You are safe in him. Because read the back of the book. And in the back of the book, the lamb wins. In the back of the book, all will be peace and joy forevermore. And so I want to appeal to you today, to the church. Has the message today made sense? Do you recognize that when you come to pray to God, it is an awesome privilege that God wants to provide all of your needs and that his relationship with you is one that is intensely personal. That's the kind of relationship he wants to have with you. And here's the question. Jesus taught his disciples to pray in this manner. 
And this was how he was praying. This was how he modeled his prayers around these kinds of themes. And the question is, how do you and I compare to Jesus in our prayer life? He came from hours spent in prayer and lived a life in ministry where he was showing, doing amazing things. What would it be if you and I would commit, maybe not hours in prayer, what if we just committed one hour? Or if that's too much, what if we just did 20 minutes every single day where we could commit time to saying, I am setting aside this time to talk with God and we treat it like a divine date that we have every single day. What, what would it be if we did that? I believe that just like Napoleon, as he growled at looking at the map of China, I believe that God's church would wake up. I believe that the Holy Spirit would move mightily in our midst and we would see miracles happen because we would see God's kingdom being built up through his people as they pray and they seek his face together. So my appeal is, Will you commit more time to spending time in prayer with Jesus? And if that's something that you will say with me today, I invite you to stand where you are. You know what that time looks like for you. I know what it looks like for me, but you know what that will look like for you. And I believe that as you stand, and as you make this personal commitment between you and God, but you're standing so that you're going to remember it, I believe that you will see God answer prayers in your life and it's going to be a wonderful thing for this church but not just this church this community will be impacted because God's people are praying would you bow your heads as we pray our father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us for our debts as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May God bless you. You may be seated. Let's pray. Dear Lord, this song is the prayer of our hearts. Lord, haste the day when our faith becomes sight. Lord, as we leave this church today, we pray that you would go with us and we pray that you bless our fellowship lunch that will happen and bring us back this afternoon and this evening as we continue to spend time together in prayer and fellowship together. And so, Lord, we pray that you'll keep us faithful so that one day soon we won't have to pray like this with eyes closed, but we will look up and we will see you face to face. Until then, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.